What is the biggest relief about awakening? Well, I could point to a few things, but one of the biggest reliefs, one of the biggest releases, one of the biggest surprises is that what we didn't realize is that we were struggling against reality. We were struggling against the natural flow and we've been doing it for a long time. We might realize this to some degree, but we don't realize how pervasive that struggle, that taking a position opposed to the natural flow was occurring. And the funny thing about this is it feels like this struggle. It feels like you. When I point to the sense of I am or who am I, I'm not exactly talking about the same thing that I am here when I say it feels like you, but they do relate in this sense. The struggling aspect of what feels like you, the one that feels like it has to get its life right, get conditions right, react to things in an appropriate way or the right way for you or the right way for ethics or morality or duty that struggling sense is not really what you are. When the I am sense is realized or when identity drops out of the conceptual self, the reactive struggling self that's bound in thought, then this pure I am sense has a very different feel to being you. It's not a you that's contingent upon anything. It's not a you that's contingent upon a set of conditions or getting something right. It's a sense of you or even a sense of just pure being that's not contingent upon anything at all. And that makes all the difference. So I just wanted to clarify that point, first of all. It's almost as if, as someone put this to me once, it's Velcroed together. The ideas about being you and what you need to do and how you need to be and how you need to fit into the world and how the world is and how reality is, even how spirituality is or awakening is, all of that patchwork of ideas and beliefs is really heavy and it's laden with this identity sense. That's not what you are. That's not the pure sense of being that can be realized. Um, but because that pure sense has the ability to accommodate anything, any set of conditions, any experience, because it doesn't push or pull against anything, it's like crystal or air or ether. It just doesn't get stuck to anything. So it's intertwined in that heavier sense of being, the heavier sense of being you, the heavier sense of how things need to be or how you need to be or what you need to do with your life to make it better, what you need to do even with your thoughts, all of that. They, they seem like the same thing, but they're not at all. That's perhaps the key to the first shift or the first awakening. Not understanding that, but somehow seeing through that. That can happen randomly by grace. It can happen through practice. It can happen through inquiry. Who knows how it happens? We can't directly cause it to happen. I'm sure of that but we can sort of cultivate the soil and give it a better chance. Really, that means getting out of our own way or seeing that the sense of separate, heavy, reactive self is just not actually anything. It's not real, but it feels heavy. It feels real and it's very distracting and it burns up a lot of our energy. And then sometimes by just seeing that through inquiry, through bumping into the right person or listening to the right pointing, it just disentangles itself. And in that pure sense of being, which you don't necessarily call anything, you don't feel like, you don't walk around going, oh, this is I am, or I am, I am. It's not like that. It's just a, a it's just such a simple and endlessly flexible, fluid experience that you don't refer to the experience. You don't separate yourself from the experience to, to talk or think about it. It's a instinct and the instinct is freedom. The instinct is peace because there's nothing to grasp. There's nothing to figure out, nothing to do, nothing to struggle with anymore. So 
that disentangling you could call awakening, but you don't have to. So what I initially was referring to in this video is that this heaviness, this sense of struggle with life, that ultimately it's the sense that you are separate from life, meaning the world or your life or your lover, friends, family, problems, work, your whatever, <laughs> your craft, your passions, your hobbies, your emotions, your thoughts, that's all somehow separate from you, even though you may not look at it directly that way. It feels that way. It's set up that way in the mind. And that results in a near constant sense of struggle, of heaviness. But again, it's so constant or so um, normal, let's say. It's, it's shared among humans and it's reinforced, but it's also reinforced that it's okay and normal to be this way, to feel this way. So we don't notice it as such. And so there's a little bit of a inauthenticity perhaps about this. It's a place we don't look. You could call it shame because shame sort of says, don't look here, right? If you look here, it's you're in trouble. Don't look at this part of yourself. You know, this is where you're bad. This is where you don't want to show anyone else this, this place, this part of you. So you could call it shame. Uh, and it's sort of a barrier to looking in this place I'm talking about. But the physical experience of it, the physical, emotional, and mental experience of it is just heaviness. It's struggle. It feels like you're moving through molasses instead of air, in a sense. Um, and that all feels like you. The heaviness of you, the struggle of you, the problem of you, the... Um, the shame of being you. Now, none of that's real. None of that is actually what you are at all. But because of this dualistic setup, you apart from this, that, and everything else, it sets up a certain duality in consciousness that makes it hard to actually investigate this. It makes it hard to see it as such. So a lot of times these pointers, these videos, they're really just trying to help you, however that happens, get that paradigm shift where you realize, oh, I see all of that activity, all that mental activity of trying to figure out who I am, what I am, where I'm going, what awakening is, how to get there, whatever. That's not really real. It's not identity. It's not what you are for sure. It's a side effect of the paradigm of identity. But the first step to recognizing what that means is to experience yourself or experience identity as infinite, as unbound in consciousness, as consciousness, which turns out to be everything that you've ever experienced in the way that you take yourself to be. Now, it gets very paradoxical once you penetrate the paradigm of identity itself. Then we have to start using different types of language or using no language at all. But, but for the purposes of what we're talking about here, it's really a matter of disentangling the struggle from identity, from beingness, from the most subtle, flexible, unbound, unconditioned sense of being alive, being here now, of just aliveness. Once that's let go of, or something lets go, it will shift, it will transform, but it's not anything transforming into something else. It's a sense of being something or being something discreet or being something that struggles is just nowhere to be found. It's realized it wasn't really there at all. And you kind of pick up this sense that, wow, all of the struggle was really only struggling against struggle. Struggle only struggles against struggle, right? The <laughs> The seeking mind imagines something into being that doesn't actually exist and then seeks it. And it uses its own impression of the senses to construct that object of seeking, not what's actually sensed. Once you see, feel, taste, hear what's actually sensed, there's nothing to seek. You, There's no distance, there's no separation, there's no fixation of any kind. So, so it's only the mind's snapshot of the apparent external world that turns into an object of seeking. So all of this is done in the mind. The seeking and the seeker and that which is sought 
are all basically the same thing and they're all made out of thought. So this is a huge release when you stop deriving any identity from that, from the seeking, from the struggle, from the one who has to figure it out. Things get much more calm. Is it as simple as just stopping? Sometimes it is. If that works for you, that's great. If you can just stop, stop taking reference from thoughts right now, so be it. If you have to keep inquiring and exhausting all of those cognitive mind roads, seeing that every single one of them is a dead end until something just shifts, so be it. Whatever works, expose yourself to whatever moves things around inside, causes paradigm shifts, disentangles identity, whatever it is. If it's videos, books, inquiry, meditation, that's fine. But ultimately it's about a letting go that happens that you can't force to happen yourself because you, as you take yourself to be, are what is actually let go of. That's what disentangles. And then it's not there. Then it's just a fluidity, a freedom, a peace, freedom from the illusion of space, the illusion of time, the illusion of struggle, the illusion of agency. What's that like? It's not describable, but it's freedom. It's truth. It's what's real. Well, even real doesn't make sense there, but it's just indescribable. That's why all these funny words get used like thusness or isness or emptiness or the unconditioned. The unconditioned is pretty good because it's not conditioned by the mind. And everything that's conditioned by the mind is what you experience as solidity, a world, a self and another, space, time, progress, solidity, weight. So the unconditioned is pretty good. I also like indeterminacy, but it doesn't matter what words we use because the words can always, always, always be co-opted by the intellect. When you start comparing one word to another word and comparing it to other concepts, you're misusing this pointing, just so you know. I get that sometimes. Someone will say, you said this word, is it like this word or like that one? Or is it like this Buddhist concept? Which is fine if someone wants to talk philosophically, but I usually just say, I either avoid the question or I point to what I feel underneath the question. Or if I want to be really direct, I'll just say, what good is it going to do you to compare one idea to another idea when I'm pointing past ideas as the first movement of awakening? To go beyond concept is just the beginning. So yeah, these words can be very tricky, but it's a sense, it's a feel. This can have an effect, and if it doesn't, that's fine too. It doesn't matter. That's all I got for today.